Um, hello everybody, um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, with you today and I have with me uh, Luis Alberto Moreno who's the president of the Inter-American Development Bank who just gave a talk here at IE with us. Thank you for finding the time uh, to be with us. I know you've, you've had a very busy day so uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Something, uh, let me go straight to the questions I want to ask you. So something you mentioned in there, you said one of the challenges in Latin America uh, was the lack of uh, sort of the lack of depth to the trade interconnectedness between the different organizations within the region and the different economies. So you uh, defended deepening uh, the trade ties and the trade production cycles, uh, deepening other forms of integration. I think you said pension passporting and a couple of other examples that you gave, sort of following the EU or the European model. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in a world today where we seem to be moving squarely in the opposite direction, back to borders, back to controlling trade, back, back to bilateral arrangements on trade. Uh, how feasible do you think that is in the medium term and how do you see these two, the need for a deepening in that space, but also the political trends that seem to be pushing in the other direction? Do you think Latin America is immune to this or do you see these trends also taking place there? I mean, how do you, how do you see these two th things coming together? Well, certainly we've always had uh, protectionist wins. They have been in, in Latin America in the past and they probably will remain there. Uh, notwithstanding that, I am of the view that these kinds of things are really where a source of our growth remains. Uh, simply because uh, we trade very little across uh, Latin America, uh, roughly 20%, whereas Europe is over 60%. So there is in this world where there is all these protectionist wins, clearly Latin America needs to make itself as a platform to attract more investment and basically be a place where you can source and be an opportunity for Europe, for Asia, or for North America. Now, for that to happen, it's not just about trade, it's about logistics, it's about the way uh, we, we do our, our customs uh, uh, union, it is how we have uh, how customs actually operate in the borders where you have much uh, electronic uh, windows for instance but you know you it doesn't make sense to make a huge road to get from one country to the next and it takes you 10 hours in the customs you know mm -hmm. or how uh, an authorized uh, you know the same company that exports to the same set of clients should have a fast track you know things like that but you know but let me push you on this these things which are fairly technical, and they were very technical in the EU case, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people speak of EU integration now as this wonderful political project, but when you break it down mm -hmm. to its component, they were highly technical things. First, we do away with tariff barriers, then with non-tariff barriers, so this deepening. Uh, but underlying all of that was a deep political willingness to give up sovereignty because all of these processes end up limiting you in various ways. You, you, you start sharing production processes, uh, and you start, in essence, giving up, elevating sovereignty to these broader, higher levels. Do you see that in Latin America? Look, I, I think it's easier for a set of countries. The countries that are dependent on their growth, given foreign trade, given countries like Chile, like Peru, like Colombia, these are countries that to grow mm -hmm. need to have a bigger percentage of their GDP into trade. It's not the case of Brazil, and perhaps to a less degree in, in Argentina. But I see there's a change of winds in those countries, which they now realize that they need to, to open up more. So I, I think that, you know, the moment is there. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it will take a lot of political leadership and a lot of hard work because putting those things together, the so-called trade facilitation, the financial integrations, the regulatory convergence on a variety of areas from financial uh, to, you know, the whole source of, uh, you know, embracing innovation, all of these things take time. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of work, but I, I do believe that this is our moment to do just that. And you see the IDB as a catalyzer for this, as a facilitator of this process? I mean, that's a wonderfully big and ambitious project for the IDB to take on or to help with. Right? Absolutely, and, and this is where we see our role. I, I think uh, uh, we have been doing this, it's part of our DNA, uh, through not only the work that we do in, in helping finance many of these uh, endeavors, but also everything that we can do in terms of the knowledge creation and bringing to bear you know experiences from the EU from other parts of the world which Latin America can nourish itself and advance. Take forward. Um, a question on technology which you also mentioned before so <laughs> when 
well, you know, one of the big debates we have um, in Europe and in the US and in other places is, you know, what are we going to do with all of these people that are going to be displaced by automation and computerization and, and, you know, what are we going to do with these folks that are currently in the services sector, are currently developing fairly complex jobs that require high levels of human capital, and how do we move them to these new job categories of which we're uncertain, and you mentioned this mm -hmm. uh, in the room, and by the way, this is for us a great concern as an educational institution, you know, we're training people, mm -hmm. undergraduates that are going to be in the jobs market 40, 50 years. So this is the concern in this part of the world. In, uh, in other parts of the world where you still have a large primary sector and secondary sector in some places, you are seeing not just automation in those two, like we saw in Europe and other places, but you're also seeing the disappearance of a lot of the services jobs. Mm -hmm. So how do you jump, how do you move people, how do you bypass you know, the traditional development uh, ladder that we've seen and train people to move straight into these new job categories that we're still a little bit uncertain. So how concerned are you about human capital development in Latin America? I mean, no, it's the single biggest issue for a variety of reasons. It's not only our, our quickest way to uh, eliminate poverty, but equally it is a, a central need. Probably these things, with, you know, this technological revolution is moving at an exponential rate. And it will affect countries differently depending, as you correctly say, in their level of development. Mm. There are things that you can optimize in Europe that on a cost-benefit analysis you don't necessarily need to optimize today mm. in Latin America. I mean, robots in, in factories, still maybe you know, labor is cheaper than robots in, in some countries, so that's why the switch has not been done. But it will be done. Mm. And, and so the question is, how do we adequate institutions? How do we understand that through the life cycle of people you have to do education? I mean, uh, universities are going to have to be adept to, con to continuous education, to vocational training, to uh, all the uses of technology through so-called massive online courses. I'm always surprised by the number of people that take massive online courses. It, right. You know, the very first course that Harvard developed, the people who developed it was some course of engineering and they were surprised that in a country like Colombia, they had like a following of uh, 200 out of, you know, but that shows you the appetite of people wanting to learn and to be with the times. Absolutely. Let me ask you a final question about um, about the politics of the region. So this year, next year, these are very important years, electoral years in Latin America. Uh, I think something like more than half of the population will be will be called to the to the polls. Um, you were mentioning before the swing of the pendulum back to uh, perhaps more traditional liberal cosmopolitan political leadership in various Latin American countries, opening a window to the furthering of an agenda that we seem to have lost in other places, <laughs> whether it's the U.S. or Britain. Uh, when you look at the political processes ahead in Latin America, where do you see the biggest sources of risk and the biggest sources of opportunity for windows like the one you mentioned before, opening and others? Look, I, I think the biggest source of opportunity is that still we are, we have a demographic bonus, still it won't be there forever. We have growing middle classes, therefore our domestic markets, uh, consumption markets have grown a lot. And companies that go in Latin America will see the kind of growth that they don't see today, for instance, in, in Europe and other places where there's still markets to be developed. So I think that's basically the, the, the source of opportunity. In what sectors? Largely in infrastructure and in capital intensive sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right that in terms of uh, uh, you know the, the, the muscle driven jobs probably we could still have they were going to be replaced uh, by automation in, in here in terms of, of uh, uh, risk clearly there's you know we, we are in a moment where you know we're out of the financial crisis uh, central banks basically are pulling back on their monetary policy that will have an impact on interest rates depends how those interest rates go up or down will affect capital flows into Latin America and that's perhaps an area to watch. Mm -hmm. Actually, I said last question, but let me now that I have the luxury of having you here. Uh, we were discussing China before uh, and you know this is one of the big geopolitical and economic shifts of our time and Africa has been investing very heavily in Latin America to the point of replacing traditional investment partners and uh, economic partners that the region has had. How permanent and structural do you see that presence there? Or do you see it much more superficial, very much based on commodities and just trading of particular goods? Or do you see them actually investing and settling and opening up subsidiaries? And do you see that influence being as structural as maybe Spain's or the US or other traditional partners? Look, I think you have two major countries in the world, China and, and India. And they will, and the rest of Asia, of course. This will be, there will be around the world close to two and a half billion people who are going to move into the middle classes. They're going to have a change of, of consumption habits. 
those changes of consumption habits are going to be driven by, you know, they probably eat more beef, they probably eat be better proteins, and all of that is commodities which we produce abundantly. So there's going to continue to be a, a pressure, I believe, largely on food commodities. Mm -hmm. Mineral commodities depend more on the, on the business cycle around the world. And again, there you have two countries like Chile and, 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 and Peru, which control 40% of the copper in the world, 70% of the lithium of the world, which powers batteries, electronics. So we will continue to have that. Our challenge is how do we uh, do like Australia, how we do like Canada, which are commodity producers, but at the same time, we're able to develop high precision manufacturing, uh, much better agricultural uh, technologies, uh, and at the same time, high quality services. And high quality services depend on access to bandwidth, access to technology, uh, the, the, the much more uh, investment in, in science and technology and of course education. Well, big challenges ahead. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time. Thank you.